Welcome to this week's Planet Shakers podcast. We have just released a brand new Planet Shakers Christmas album in time for the Christmas season. Go check it out on your favourite streaming platform today. Now for today's podcast. Well, I love Christmas time. And um, we have we have three uh, small humans at home, uh, two two-year-olds and a four-year-old. And, you know, our uh, our kids are at an age where I think we're working out as a family what traditions we want to kind of set up with our kids because these are the years that they're going to look back on and say, that's what we always did as a family to celebrate. And so at Christmas time, what are the particular things we're going to do to celebrate what Christmas is all about? And man, we do some funny things as, uh, as humanity to celebrate Christmas time. You know, we, I don't even know where Christmas tree, the whole idea comes from. I like it. I don't really know where the whole idea of the big fat man in the red suit, like there's a few ideas of where he came from. I don't know where that all came from. I like it. You know, we go to the shopping malls and we max out our credit card just to say, happy birthday, Jesus. Yeah, this is how I'm gonna celebrate you. And then I saw something a couple of weeks ago. You know, because people celebrate a whole bunch of reasons for Christmas, but there really is one true reason that we celebrate Christmas. But sometimes, People are like, I'm gonna celebrate the real reason of Christmas, but only just. I don't wanna give it a whole celebration. I wanna give it the bare minimum. And I saw this online two weeks ago. Would you look at this picture that I found? This, ladies and gentlemen, is a nativity scene. Depending if you prefer a spherical nativity or rectangular nativity, this is the bare minimum nativity scene that you could possibly have. And I've worked it out. We, all, we can work out which one Mary, Joseph and Jesus are. I'm not sure which one's Mary and which one Joseph because, you know, Mary did just give birth and traditionally. Anyway, um, the shepherd in this one brought his sheep, but I think the sheep in this one came alone. And then you got the, the three wise men. But uh, how ridiculous. Is it, are the things that our world comes up with. I think it's hilarious. Our world does some funny things. And, and the truth is, I'm not really here to hate on any, a, any way that people say, well, maybe I'm here to hate on this a little bit, but um, I'm not really here to knock any way that people celebrate Christmas. But I do think it is, it is important that we understand what it is that we are celebrating this Christmas time with all of our traditions and our celebrations, what they're based on. And so I just wanted to talk today about the very first Christmas. And I was thinking, what, what should we call today? You know, we, we need to have a title for the sermon. And I thought I could just call it Merry Christmas or Happy Christmas or Season's Greetings. But I thought, you know what? I'm gonna call this sermon today, Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's what I got. Mary Had a Little Lamb. So I wanna preach to you about Mary Had a Little Lamb. And to do that, I don't want to just take us back to the first Christmas. I want to take us back a lot further, about a thousand, over a thousand years before the very first Christmas. Are you ready? We find ourselves in the book of Exodus and the children of God are in slavery, but God sent a deliverer by the name of Moses. Now, and He was someone that was gonna lead God's people out of bondage into freedom and into the promises that God had prepared for them. But when this deliverer was born, the king of that time realised, hang on, there's something significant going on. And so he made an edict to kill all of the boys under the age of two, trying to wipe out the deliverer. But of course, Moses survived. He grew and eventually, with the call of God, he confronted the ruler of his time, the one that was keeping God's children captive. And so there was this battle, this epic battle of the ages uh, that really proved the divine power of God over the power of this world. And in a final display to change the heart of Pharaoh, because this evil ruler had hardened his heart against every opportunity God gave him, the Bible recounts that the sons of the enemy were about to be killed by a plague, the plague of death, that would take away the firstborn in every household, but protection, covering, deliverance, that was gonna be provided for the children of God. And the Bible describes it in Exodus 12, it's gonna be on the screen, it says that they needed to take a lamb and your lamb shall be without blemish, 
a male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some some of the blood and put it on the doorposts of the houses in which they eat it. And it says in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Then it says in verse 14, this is a day to remember. Each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. It's a law for all time. And that's what they called the very first Passover. The lamb was sacrificed and the blood put over the entrance to the house to protect those inside from death. The shedding of the Lamb's blood provided life for those under its covering. The blood of an innocent Lamb shed for the people of God. And I love this. As I was reading the story this week, I, was, I, I read all the way to verse 14 because I wanted to point it out. It says very specifically, this should be celebrated every year and this should be told to the generations. And as I was reading it, I was stirred. And so yesterday morning, I sat down with my three children. My wife had already left and I read to them the story of Christmas. I'll be honest, I don't think they paid attention. I'm pretty sure they took in barely any of it. But I love the fact that this is an important thing that we tell the real reason behind why we celebrate. And so you fast forward from this moment, some 1300 years, and we get to the first celebration of Christmas. You know, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it actually calls Jesus our Passover lamb. And we're in the Old Testament, a lamb was slain once a year as a temporary covering for God's people. Here, we know that Jesus gave His life on the cross once as an eternal covering over us. The innocent lamb of God, whose blood was shed to cover humanity. And like the original lamb covered God's people from death, so too does Jesus. Because the ultimate victory of the cross is not that Jesus gave His life to make bad people good, but Jesus gave His life to make dead people alive. And that's the greatest miracle that Jesus does. I want you to understand that what started on the very first Christmas is a promise we get to live in today. And so we get to the first Christmas. Now Luke chapter 2 says this in verse 4. We know that the ones who gave birth to Jesus was Mary and Joseph. And at the time when they were getting ready to give birth, there was a census that was called in the land. And they had to travel from Galilee, from Nazareth, up up in the north of of Israel, down to the south. I think it's some 60, 70 kilometres down to Bethlehem. And they had no cars, no planes, no helicopters, no trains. The only way they could get there is by camel. And, uh, and, and they had to make their way there because there was a census at the time. And as well as having no cars, they had no Australia Post or Israel Post. And so they couldn't just mail their census in. They had to go to the homeland from where their lineage came from. So we pick it up in verse 4. It says, Joseph went from Galilee, from Nazareth, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no Airbnb or booking.com. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone all around them and they were filled with great fear. But the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You're gonna find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to all men. And in verse 15, it says, When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go 
Let's see this thing that's happened, which God has told us about. And so they hurried to the village and they, they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard their story were astonished. But Mary kept these things in her heart. She thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. What an amazing story. What an amazing recounting of a miraculous night. And as I was reading this story, I was drawn to a couple of uh, facets of it. The first thing I wanted to think about was the shepherds. There were shepherds all over Israel. The job of a shepherd was to care for the sheep. But these particular shepherds that were located in the fields outside of Bethlehem, their assignment was a little bit different from many of the other shepherds. Their specific assignment was to raise sheep that would give birth to lambs that were born and then to be kept without blemish. Because these particular lambs were to be delivered to the temple a year after they were born, perfect. No blemish, no spot, no injury, so that these lambs could be sacrificed. And what happens is when these sheep would give birth, the shepherds would grab the lambs and wrap them up in swaddling cloths and carry these lambs around and care for them to ensure that they were perfect without blemish because these lambs had a specific assignment on their life that they were specifically born so that they would die. So you would understand now that when the angel shows up that night out of all the shepherds in the land to those shepherds, that all of a sudden they had an intimate understanding of what to look for, a baby wrapped in the same swaddling cloth they would use, laid in an animal's feeding trough. And uh, uh, they, they had this incredible encounter when the angel appeared to them, that they, they ran straight to the occasion. But notice as well that God came first to these shepherds among the lowest people in, all, all, in the whole society. God didn't come to the kings, didn't come to the priests, didn't come to the rich, didn't come to the famous. The first people He went and shared the message with was the lowly. And in fact, He didn't just choose the low people to be among a very few witnesses of that whole occasion. He chose the low people to be the very first messengers to carry the good news of this occasion. Even with all the mess of their life, God chose them to be messengers. I don't know if you've ever been at a low point in life. Let's be honest, looking around this room, we probably all could look back on some point in this year and go, man, that was a real low moment in my life. Or perhaps you could look back on a moment in your life and think, man, that I felt stuck in a pretty low position in my life. Maybe you're in this room this afternoon and that's how you feel today. Truth is, the Bible talks all the time about mountains and valleys, high points and low points. There's, there's seasons in our life we go through where we, maybe we do feel down and out. Maybe we do feel stuck by our circumstances. Maybe we do feel like we're at a low point. Well, I love stories for reasons like that. The Bible says that God will choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The truth is, there is never so low you can get that God can't come and visit you. God can't choose you. God can't reach you. God can't call you to come and witness and to be a messenger of His good news. Be encouraged this Christmas. God, God chose first to come to the lowly. See, the truth is God's not looking at your credentials. God's not looking at your worldly status. God's not looking for how high up you feel or how highly positioned you are. See, God can take anyone. Or maybe just this Christmas. Christmas in general is a difficult time for you. I literally just saw a friend of mine on Instagram post about how this is their first December without their father. You know, there's many reasons why Christmas can be a time of celebration for the world, but a time of difficulty for individuals. It can be a moment where we're reminded of the things we've lost. Or maybe you feel like all year you've been watching people celebrate their victory and you're still in the middle of your battle. Well, I got good news for you this Christmas. This year, 
was the greatest victory that was just beginning to unfold. And it didn't look like a victory at a time. This was not a child born to kings. This was not a child born in a seven star hotel. This was a little baby born to a few, a couple of nobodies in an inn, wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. But this right here was the start of the greatest victory and the greatest gift. See, victory doesn't always look like victory to start with. Breakthrough doesn't always look like breakthrough to start with. This might not look like a great gift, but I'm telling you, this is the greatest gift humanity's ever received. This is first Christmas. But there's another side to the story I wanna show you. Can we go deeper? See, the shepherds weren't the only ones to be led by God to witness Jesus. There are others included in our nativity scenes. Even though they didn't show up for probably many months, if not a year, they are the wise men. See, in our retelling of the story, there's always three wise men. But in fact, the Bible never says there's three. It just says that there's three gifts. And in fact, a lot of Bible historians suggest that there could be anywhere from 10 to 15 to as many as 100 of them show up. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it says, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen. When it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And going into that, oh sorry, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into that house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then they opened up their treasures, offering him gifts of gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. These were the wise men, or some translations call them the Magi. See, it's understood that they showed up sometime after the birth of Jesus. Because if you remember back to the story of Moses at the very start, how the king declared an edict to kill all the boys under the age of two, trying to wipe out the deliverer. The same thing happened, the evil ruler, the king of this time, Herod, when he found out that there was a king about to be born or, or that had been born, he declared an edict to kill all of the boys under the age of two. And so there's much understanding that anywhere from a few months up to two years after Jesus' birth is when the wise men showed up. Which means the wise men didn't show up to worship newborn baby Jesus. The wise men showed up to worship toddler Jesus. Now I've got some theological questions that I'm not sure are gonna be answered until we get to heaven. But the Bible says that Jesus was without sin. What does that include? Are all the naughty things that toddlers do sin? Or are they not sin? Because they haven't yet reached the age of understanding. I'm not sure. Because can you imagine toddler Jesus? Like Mother Mary trying to feed Him a bottle of water and boom, turns it into milk. Or Mother Mary trying to bathe baby Jesus, but He decides, I don't want a bath tonight. So He walks on the bath water. Get in the water. Or maybe, just maybe, Mother Mary being a wonderful mother, decides to make Jesus His favourite meal. She knows it's His favourite because He loved it two nights ago and He loved it a night ago, but tonight He hates it and it's ruined His day. And so He flips the tables over. I don't know. New, newborn children are very easy to look at and think, oh, they're so peaceful. Every few hours, there's a bit of a mess. And as long as you're not the mum and the dad, you don't really have to have anything to do with that. But other than that, outside those few minutes, every few hours, they're just perfect. You can pick them up and pat them like a dog that sleeps. So, you know, shh, 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 shh. And, and just, just it's, it's beautiful, it's lovely. But see, I feel like it's all one big ruse for parents that, you know, you, you feel like you once you've got that kid sleeping through the night, you feel like an expert. You're doing this thing right. You're amazing at what you do, but it's all a trick just to lull you into a, a false sense of security because then this child grows and it starts to move. And the moment those children start to move, let me tell you, I was at home yesterday with three toddlers all on my own. Some people call it babysitting, other people call it parenting. Depending on how the day is going, it depends on what I call it. But you know, at one moment, I got a kid deciding to pull all of their dresses out of their wardrobe. Another, at the same moment, I got another child in the backyard tearing leaves off a plant that I've carefully cultivated. And then in the same moment, I got a third child in the front room, carpeted room, deciding, 
hmm, this would be a great place to wet my pants. And then it's like they all boom, secretly communicate and, and they just all rotate. And then I got another child in the pantry pouring flour and baking soda back and forth. And then another one decides they wanna grab the toothpaste and paint the mirror. And I'm like, this is insane. When I was growing up in church circles, we used to talk about this thought. I heard it said many, many times that, you know, when, when dealing with people and mistakes people make, you know, we, we, we love the sinner. We hate the sin. I feel like that's what it's like with raising toddlers sometimes. I, I love the child. I hate the toddler. <laughs> and so these, these wise men, they show up to worship toddler Jesus. As funny as that thought is, you gotta understand, these wise men were maybe the most unlikely people to be included in the Christmas story. See, the truth is they, they most likely worshipped other deities and were probably sorcerers of some kind. And notably, they were the first non-Jewish people to come and seek and to worship Jesus as the King. And the three gifts that they gave to Jesus show us that at least in some part, they understood who they were worshipping because the gifts show us His identity. First, you've got the gold, which signifies the royalty and kingship. And then you've got the frankincense, which was a, a type of incense that they would burn in the worship of God. And so you recognise His kingship and you recognise His Godship. And the last thing was myrrh, which was an oil, which they would use to embalm dead people. So you have a King who is God, who was born, that He would die. You see, God, God used the shepherds, the lowly, and here God invited the outsiders, the wise men. So we see in this Christmas story, there's a lot of things that we could see, but I just chose these two. That Jesus was witnessed and preached by the lowly to show that no, ma no matter how little you have or how low you feel in life right now, Jesus came for you. And then you have Him being worshipped by the outsiders. That no matter how far away from God you are, Jesus welcomes you and Jesus invites you in because the truth of the Gospel is there really is no outsiders. Everyone is invited. You see, Jesus' birth is the real thing that we celebrate at Christmas. The provision of heaven, a baby that was born to die, a lamb that was sent to be sacrificed. And the countdown to the cross started on that very first Christmas day to bring life where there was death. And so in twofold, I, I, I firstly wanted to encourage you this Christmas that we would celebrate the right things. And like that very first Passover in Egypt, that we would tell it. We would tell it to all people. We would tell it to all generations, that people would know exactly the power and the significance of what it is that we get to celebrate on, on next Monday. And let's make sure that we invite others too, because outside those doors in this world and in our city, we know that there are people who feel down and out right now. There are people that feel like they're the lowly ones right now. There are people that feel stuck in a low position and there are people that feel like they are the outsiders. Let's welcome them in this Christmas. Let's invite them in this Christmas. We got opportunities next Sunday. We got opportunities next Monday. Let's make sure people know that they're invited into this good news. They're invited into His presence. But today we've got a few minutes left. I wanna invite us to stand to our feet because we've got an opportunity. We've got an opportunity for a few minutes to do what the shepherds did that night. And to do what the wise men did when they appeared, however long later. We had an opportunity to worship. And see, the whole thing that Jesus came to bring was life. The Bible says in John 10, 10, He came to bring life. He came to bring life. And, and, and 
when we come in worship, even today, these 2,000 something years later, that's what it is that He wants to pour out. He wants to pour out life. He wants to pour out life where there's death. He wants to pour out hope where there's despair. He wants to pour out healing where there's hurt. He wants to pour out restoration where there's brokenness. That's what happens when we come and worship the King. That's what happens when we come into His presence. Anything is possible. And whatever you need, you're gonna find it in the presence of our King. I want to stir you this Christmas today. In a moment, we're going to do something we do most services. We're going to open these altars and invite you to worship down the front. But here's a special encouragement I want to disturb people with today. Maybe you come to church. You're not usually one of the people that step out of your seat. And you're like, ah, it's concrete up the front. It's concrete where I'm standing. It doesn't really make a difference. It's all the same ground. I would argue it makes a big difference where you position yourself. And, it, and it's symbolic of sorts. You know, often many weeks over here, we celebrate baptism. What is that? It's a symbol. It's an outward ex- display of an inward change. Same thing when we step out of our seats, the place where we're comfortable, the place where we're quite content to just stand here. You can receive from God there, of course you can. But I think something powerful happens as an outward demonstration of an inward prayer to God to say, God, I don't want to stay where I am. I don't want to settle in where I am. I don't want to be satisfied with all I have right now. I want to press into all that You have for me. I want to step out of what I might have come into agreement with in lack and in loss. And I want to step into life. I want to step into Your power and Your presence. I want to position myself, God, where I can worship You. Thanks for joining us today. I hope that your faith was filled and you were encouraged. If you have any prayer requests or want to connect with us further, search for us on our social media at Planet Shakers. We'd love to hear from you.